Hi, this is Eric, and if you haven't subscribed to our channel yet, right down there is the subscribe button. Click that, subscribe with us. We would love to have you along for the journey. Hi, this is Eric, and I'm with Driven Industries, and I want to thank you for tuning into our podcast. You know, I created this company around people helping people, and you know, no one going through it alone, and no one struggling alone. And so I've done these weekly podcasts, and I, again, really appreciate you tuning in. If you get a chance, make sure that you subscribe to our channel, you know, like our our, uh, our podcast, you know, share it with your friends, because it's about sharing the resources and the tools that we learn that really can make a difference in other people's lives. So a big special thanks to uh, Jenna here and the podcast that I have coming up with her and just the sharing that she has, you know, being new to sobriety and just being new to the program, there, there's always so much excitement that's going on and so much that goes through our head and it's so much of a change and a difference that we want to make with others because, you know, we've been there, we've been to the bottom and, you know, to pull ourselves out of it is just, it's an amazing experience and to be able to share that with others is huge. And so, you know, she had reached out to me on uh, Twitter and we it started talking and you know social media is great because there's a huge huge just support group out there i mean it, taking it in in steps is also important but you know getting the right support around you is just so important in the steps of recovery and you know just hearing the excitement the passion in her voice and you know we all hit rock bottom you know at a certain point and and when we decide to make a change in our lives it's it's huge and we never know what's going to spark that change and you know just getting a chance to talk to her she's five uh, five weeks sober when we had started this podcast and it's just I, I give her so much credit in the world because you can just you can hear the enthusiasm you can hear the excitement and sometimes it's hard to carry that on and you know being in the program for a while it's one of those things that sometimes we lose that excitement you know that we had when we first started so whenever we talk to somebody new, it's it's just it's awesome. It, it sparks that energy back inside you, and and just that excitement back inside you, of of knowing that hey, you know we're not alone in this, and and why we started our own journey in sobriety. So I, I hope that you get as much out of this as I did. Uh, it was a real pleasure to talk to her, and uh, we'll be doing a lot more podcasts with her. And just you know, it's about people sharing their stories and, and sharing your story of what you've been through and the challenges that you've been through. And you know, there, there's nothing better than than people helping people. So uh, you know, I give her all the credit in the world, and, and just had a lot of fun talking with her on the phone uh, and having a chance to to hear this story of hers. So you know, I, again, a big thanks to Jenna and, and sharing her story with us. And I hope you get as much out of this as I did. So, you know, you've been sober now for how long? Tuesday. Tomorrow will make five weeks. Okay, that's awesome. So you're definitely on your path. So share with me your story and, and getting sober. I mean, it, it's it's definitely a good one. I mean, talking to you on Saturday. <laughs> oh, man, where do I start? Okay, so I guess my story is a little different because... Most of the time, if you, you know, talk to people that are addicts, they had a bad childhood or they were around that. Um, they saw a lot of drugs, alcohol, violence in their house. Um, I know most of my friends that were addicts, they had something along those lines. Um, but for me, it was super different. I grew up in a pretty good household, you know. I was never exposed to drugs or alcohol. Um, I played softball at a young age. We got to travel my whole life with it. You know, by my ninth grade year in high school, I had a, a scholarship to play softball in college. You know, um, my family was a church going family. They didn't really cuss. Neither, you know, none of my parents drank or anything like that. So it was, it was really shocking to them when I came out to them that, you know, I was actually using. Um, I I, like I said, no, no problems in high school at all. I think it's a shock to, to, to every parent when... You know, I think that they know, but I also think that sometimes they get blindsided, you know, because I think a parent can kind of tell when their kid's going downhill, but, oh, exactly, yeah. but, but then when the reality really hits their face, it's a, uh, oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> Especially when my seven, he was a police officer, he's retired now, but you know, he definitely, like he was in my life since I was like five. So he, it was a more shock to him, you know, because he dealt with people like that his whole life. And he would tell us stories like, you know, I saw somebody that was overdosed, you know, so it was, it was a real shock to him when I, you know, told him, and he was like, are you serious? Like, you know, I've tried to raise you differently your whole life, but I had to explain to them, it's not, has nothing to do with how you raised me, clearly, you know, it has 
nothing to do with y'all not bringing it around because, I mean, you can move and live in different places, but drugs are everywhere. Mm-hmm. No, they are. I mean, drugs, drugs, alcohol, whatever it is, I mean, it's so easily accessible that, you know, growing up, you want to think that you can protect your kids and you can protect everyone from it, but it's it's so readily and easily available. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, like, um, I guess, like, I, I was in an abusive household. Um, I never smoked weed, which is a lot of people's, I guess, gateway drug as well. I hated it. I've smoked it, like, twice my whole life. So I guess my story is completely different than, you know, which usual ones. Um, I'm not, you know, I don't know. So I guess after high school, um, I played college softball for two years. I got my degree in biology or applied sciences, um, and I didn't want to go to school anymore. So I joined the military. (laughs) I was in the Coast Guard. I was stationed in Miami. Um, And I think that... I was in a, a relationship then. Uh, at that time, I was with a female. Um, okay. She was in the Navy, so she was stationed in Jacksonville, Florida. So we were six hours apart from each other. Um, and I remember her coming to me and telling me, and her father said the same thing, you know, it's not going to work with y'all's distance forever. He told me, I'll never forget the words. He said, it's either my daughter or the Coast Guard. And he was right, you know. I mean, I knew it was. So I was at work one day, and a well-known officer came up behind me. He touched me inappropriately. He said some really inappropriate things. Um, So I had to go up the chain and, you know, report it. And at that time in my head, I was thinking, okay, well, I'm engaged. I've been with this person for four years. This is my way out. Right. Um, So they offered me, you know, they offered me an honorable discharge. You know, you can go home. You keep your benefits for the rest of your life. Your kids, family, you'll have it. So at 21 years old, you know, me being engaged, 15 hours away from my family that I've never been away from, I was like, you know, let's let's do it. Sure. Hoping that it would save my relationship, too. Right. Well, I guess it was like three days after I signed my final paperwork. There was no going back. Um, to get out, I was doing my last PT test, it's your physical test, mm-hmm. and I got out to a text message of her telling me she was done, um, you know, she didn't want anything else to do with me, she had found someone else, she's sorry, She and when she meant nothing to do with me, she meant nothing, like, it was almost like she died, that's how gone she was. Right, just kind of cut it off and disappeared, and it was over, done with. Oh, for sure, so, here I am, like... My whole world's crashing down on me. I just signed my life out of a career that I worked my butt off of for. I actually plan on retiring out of the military, so now I'm stuck with, great, what am I What am I going to do now? Right. Like, I thought I would handle it a lot better than I did, but that's kind of my down point of my downhill. Um, I got back home. My family was very disappointed in me, you know, because they thought, you just did this over a female. Like, what is wrong with you? Um, so that's when the pills started. Okay. Um, I got, I was doing pain pills, just four types of Percocet at that point. Um, and it wasn't an everyday thing. It was maybe like on the weekend, me and my friends would do it. Um, but then I started noticing like as the months, you know, months passed on that I would want to wait more. So I would sneak and do it during the week, which my friends would just, I guess it was their party drug kind of thing. Okay. Um, so it's, I would just do that off and on, off and on. There are periods of time where I didn't use for like a few months at a time, but I would always go back to it. Okay. So I remember in, let's see, it was 2015, I was on my way to New Orleans and I got introduced to a pain pill called Roxy mm-hmm. and it was the first time I'd, I snorted it. I was 25 years old and when I did that. It became an everyday thing. I fell in love with it. Oh, God, it was... You it, know, it was everything. everything, everything. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, I, I totally understand. <laughs> that, that, it went that, crazy downhill from there. <laughs> okay, so so talk about the downhill and, like, when you hit rock bottom. All right, so I was, what, 2000, end of 2000, so, 
December of 2015, that year, I left. I went up north near Birmingham with one of my friends. She got a job up there. She said, hey, let's let's just get away for a little bit. Maybe that'll help you. When I moved, I met um, this guy. His name is Tommy. And when I met him, I, I never seen hardcore drugs. I had never seen methamphetamine. I'd never seen heroin. I've never been around people dealing it. So he was the bad boy. Um, and I was intrigued very heavily by it. Right. And I kind of just like fell into him. And when I started dating Kim, I gave up everything. I'd never lived on the streets before. I had never, you know, had to be scared of a cop getting behind me. And so when I started dating Kim, that's what we did. I literally, there were nights where I slept in a Jeep, my Jeep, because we didn't have anywhere to go. Um, I've had guns pointed to my head, knives put up to my neck. But at the first eight months of us dating, I didn't use anything because he specifically used methamphetamines. And I didn't, you know, like uppers. My, my drug of choice was opiates. Right. So nine months after we started dating, me and him got into an altercation. And I said, you know, if I can't get high, you can't get high either. Point blank, you're done. Well, me just thinking, okay, well, he's going to get clean <laughs> is when he brought heroin into the picture. Okay. Um, because up north, it was like pulling teeth to find anything like that. Um, like any pills, pain pills, they were non-existent. So opiates up there were heroin. Right. So the first time I tried it, he brought it to me. He was like, here, I like this too. Now we can both do it. So when I did it, I, of course, you know, fell in love with it. Only started snorting it, but... I was going from this, you know, 26 year old teacher who had my life together and I had money in my bank account and, you know, I would use, but not every day to, you know, this 26 year old heroin addict now living on the streets with not a dollar in my, you know, a dollar to my name, wondering what the hell is going on. Right. And yeah, when, I mean, when I started using then, it was all over. I lost t contact with my family. I didn't want them to know, you know, see me doing anything like that. I visited every now and then, but the, the conversation never got brought up of me using. They, of course, disliked him, blah, blah, blah. Right. So fast forward to rock bottom. Um, May 4th of this past year, so six months ago, Tommy actually was killed um, okay. due to drugs. So whenever he passed away, I started using heroin IV style, started mm -hmm. shooting it up. And I mean, when he passed away, I was shooting up maybe a half a gram of heroin a day. Oh, easy. Wow. Yeah. And that's a crazy amount. Like yeah, most people is. die from doing that. And I was just a tank. I could handle so, so much. And so it was about, I guess, a month and a half ago now, I literally, I came home to visit my family, not to get clean, not to get help. I had no intentions of that. Right. I came home because I saw myself dead within six months, and I was perfectly okay with that. But I came home to visit so that my family could see me one last time. Okay. And it was insane that I was perfectly fine knowing that in a good six to eight months, I would be dead. Like most people are, you know, they're not okay with that, but I was, and I came home. My mom works in an emergency room, um, so she noticed my track marks. They were bad. I weighed 95 pounds, soaking wet. Uh, my eyes, of course, black was underneath it. I was, you know, looking rough, and she sat me down, and she begged me to get help. You know, I was like, no, no, no. Um, my little niece, she's she's three. She came up to me, and she put her hands on my face. And um, she said, I might cry, sorry. No, go right. Um, it, 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 it's emotional. I mean, it's, 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 it's when our whole entire life changes. She said, um, Uncle Tommy will always love you. She said, please get help. And when she said that, my eyes, I guess, just opened because I just wanted to be with him. 
And we've been through so much that I didn't think it was fair that someone took him away from me. Right. So, um, the next day I went up to the clinic here and I got help. And that was five weeks ago tomorrow. And what kind of help did they give you when you went to the clinic? Because it takes a lot of strength to go into a clinic or, or to get sober. It's it's hitting that rock bottom. Um, talk about going into the clinic because a lot of people get really afraid when it comes to like AA or NA or any kind of, you know, reaching out and getting help because they don't want to be judged. Um, you know, they, they know that they have a problem and, and it's a scary point in your life. <laughs> oh, yeah. I actually... <laughs> drove by the clinic about four or five times before I made it into the parking lot. Okay. And I sat in my car probably good 15, 20 minutes before I even walked through the doors. Mm -hmm. Um, But when I did, I was greeted by everyone that worked there. And like, I expected them to look at me funny, like, look at this junkie, you know, they didn't. Everybody was very understanding. Um, They wanted to help. They saw how bad of shape I was in. They, um, they actually couldn't even draw my blood because my veins were so bad from me um, using that they didn't even want to touch me because they were, you know, scared. Right. No, they were scared um, they would collapse or. You know. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, my my arms were black and blue. I didn't even try to cover it up. Like uh, it looked so bad, but they, um. They offer counseling, grief counseling. I sat there for, my first day I was there for five hours, talking to everyone. I I told them kind of my story. I was still super scared. I was going to go through withdrawals, you know, quitting. Mm -hmm. Getting off of heroin is the worst thing. I wouldn't wish that upon my worst enemy. Like, withdrawals suck so bad <laughs> um but they they gave me medicine to help with it what, what did you take to to help with your withdrawals and and i only asked because I, like i do a lot of reach outs and stuff and i've had people who hit me up with depression i've had a couple actually hit me up that you know we would talk about depression turn out that they were you know on heroin um and i'm kind of curious that like they did suboxone um i've had a couple that have done others what, what did you use to help you with the withdrawals and, and to help you detox um, yeah, that it is a suboxone methadone clinic up there, um, but I don't like I don't like suboxone at all. So um, I they gave me methadone up okay. there, but only twenty milligrams. And um, I picked that clinic because some methadone clinics they will give you three hundred, four hundred milligrams of that, and there's literally not a point to get clean if you're gonna abuse it to get high. Right. I didn't see a point in that at all. So I chose that clinic because they only give you 20 milligrams, which is absolutely nothing. You still feel withdrawals on it. Mm-hmm. And they, you know, they only give it to you for you to get clean. Okay. So you don't have to go to the hospital and you're not dehydrated and stuff. So that's what, um, that's the medicine they gave me is it was liquid methadone. It was 20 milligrams. Okay. So, um, I go every morning, um, to check in, um, to get some, my medicine. Um, I'm on a six month plan. I will only be using the methadone six months. Okay. And for the next six months, I, I'm going to wing off, even though I'm only on 20 milligrams, it still has, you know, my body is still going to have to readjust to that. Mm-hmm. So in a year I will not be on anything at all, awesome. but I knew that if I was, going to try to get off of heroin cold turkey it wouldn't have worked right there would have been no way i would have been able to handle it oh yeah no but, it's, you know, uh, the past five weeks have changed my life i everybody i've walked past say how how good i look you know my mom said she feels like she got her daughter back my grandmother who is 91 years old she has no idea about me using anything at all ever I walked into her house two weeks ago, and she looked at me, and she said, you have life in your eyes again. Well, what are you doing so different? You look so good. <laughs> That's awesome. And, and for her to say that when she has no clue, you know, no idea, it was just like, wow, like, I'm doing the right thing. Mm-hmm. And, and, and oh, it was, it's crazy. I made a blog where I, I, I would just want to help people now. That is my biggest thing. If I can save one person's life, then I have done my job. Mm-hmm. I mean, I hope to do many more, but my passion for this is so 
intense that I haven't had one urge to relapse at all. Not saying I won't ever. I will be an addict for the rest of my life. But um, as of now, I just my my passion and my fire is lit more than I have ever felt in my whole entire life. And I'm 28 years old, and I've never felt like this before. I just want to help so many people. Oh, yeah. It's hard. It's it sucks when you wake up and you look in the mirror and you're okay with dying. Mm-hmm. You're that you're that done that you go visit your family because you don't want to die. And them not have seen you in a few years like that, you get pretty low to feel like that. So, um, oh yeah, it, take, it takes hitting rock bottom to to get to the point that you know we want to make a change in our life and we want to turn it all around. And you know, it, it does. It turns into like that passion in your life all of a sudden where you do want to help others. And you know, even part of the program is you know giving it away it helps us keep sober. <laughs> so yeah. you know, it's it's a big deal to to help others. For sure. So that's that's where I am now. Um, I'm so thankful. Like I said, I just I don't know. I don't. It's all new, you know. I'm, I am only five weeks sober, mm-hmm. um, but it's been the best five weeks imaginable. I go to group every Friday um, for one hour. Okay. I'm just. I'm so. I don't know. I guess I feel like I'm. I've gotten a second chance at life, and I'm going to take it and run with it. Oh, that's awesome. Well, that's, that's what it's about. It's about, you know, making the most out of life we get back. <laughs> For sure. And I just want to help people now. That, that's all. I don't care if they, you just want to talk to me and, you know, say, hey, can you just give me a word of advice? It, all it takes is one phone call. One <laughs> phone call. That's all it took for me. One phone call and my whole life changed around. Again, a big thanks to uh, to Jenna for sharing her story with us. And, you know, it, it comes down to people helping people. And it, check us out online. See what we're all about. You know, I started this company just based on, you know, a couple different things. And that was mental illness and, and mental health along with suicide awareness and uh, sobriety because it's, it's all intertwined in so many ways. And knowing that we're not alone and we're not alone in our struggles is huge. It makes such a difference in the world. So, you know, hearing her story, you know, it really remote motivated me and, and, and kept my passion alive. And, and it's, it's great just to, to talk to those who have so much excitement, especially when it comes down to their sobriety. So big thanks again to Jenna. And if you want to do a podcast with us, you know, reach out to us through social media or through our website at redriven.com and let us know that you want to do a podcast with us, you know, be more than happy to share your story because uh, it comes down to just, it's people helping people. And, and the more stories that we hear, you know, we never know what we're going to hear that somebody's going to share that we're going to be able to really relate to and might make a big difference in our life because it's so much of this is trial and error. We, we never know what's going to work for us and you know we never know what's going to excite us or what's going to motivate us or, or what we're going to find passion in and that's what life is so much about. It's, it's finding that drive and that passion that we have in life. So you know reach out to us if you want to do a podcast. Again big thanks to Jenna for doing this with us and we got more podcasts coming up. Be putting up a couple here probably each week right now just with the, the volume of people that have been reaching out to do these. And, you know, it's exciting. It's exciting to hear everybody's story and to be able to have a chance to share them. It's, it's something I'm, I feel extremely privileged to be able to do. So thanks for listening to this. I hope you got a lot out of it. And, you know, what? I look forward to uh, sharing another message with you here shortly.